This is Art Sense, a podcast focused on educating and informing listeners about the past, present, and future of art. I'm Craig Gould. On today's episode, I speak with Masterworks founder and CEO Scott Lynn. In 2017, Lynn founded Masterworks after seeing an opportunity to securitize fine art as an asset class, and thus providing the common Wall Street investor access to blue chip art. Today, Masterworks is the largest buyer of art, acquiring seven to eight figure paintings from the likes of Joan Mitchell, Picasso, and Basquiat almost daily to meet the demand of its nearly one million users. And now, a conversation about the democratization of blue chip art with Masterworks founder and CEO, Scott Lynn. Thank you so much for being uh, my guest this week on the Art Sense podcast. Scott, you are the founder and CEO of Masterworks. And Scott, you know, I usually start with kind of tossing out to somebody, you know, hey, if you're sitting at a at a dinner party and you're next to somebody who has no idea what you do, in your case, you throw out, you know, I'm the founder of Masterworks. Odds are that guests next to you at the dinner party has probably already seen an ad from you. <laughs> Right. But how do you start to describe to them exactly who Masterworks is and what you guys are doing in the market? Sure. Yeah. I mean, very very high level Masterworks is is really the first platform for investors to invest in single pieces of art. So we we run a website, masterworks.com, where anyone can go to the website and basically can pick and choose uh, individual artworks to to invest in. You know, there, a lot of terms will get thrown around, you know, about fractionalization, securitizing art as a, a financial asset or as an, as an asset class. What is the key thing that Masterworks is trying to solve? Yeah, it's a good question. And I, and I think it's an important question. So if you if you take a step back and you just think about the, the art market today, I think the art market today behaves very similar to how it's behaved for, for arguably centuries. Um, and I and I think that's that's one of the the challenges to, to to growing the market. So, if you think about this this dynamic where there's there's always sort of, you know, this this patron artist relationship, and that goes back centuries, that goes back whatever to the Medici family. Um, I think that dynamic still exists today, where you you have artists that are really required to sell their paintings to in t- in today's today's world ultimately millionaires there's probably there's probably not anyone who's who's worth less than a million dollars that's buying a hundred thousand dollar primary market painting right mm-hmm. and and we think that's a problem fundamentally because if you if you want to grow the art market you need to bring in new people who can support artists that are not just just millionaires and and regardless of how big the art market seems, I think a lot of people listening to this probably know that it's really an industry that revolves around, we think, less than 10,000 people. So I think that's that's fundamentally a problem. If you want to grow a market or grow an industry, you're always constrained by just a very few number, ultimately, of customers, which which is what the art market has today. I think what we're really getting to there is how bringing in a new class of investor is actually going to unlock capital that can grow the market, right? Because I mean, one of the things that has kind of been a a topic over the years when we talk about art funds or just uh, someone's ability to liquidate art in general in the market is the ability to do that whenever you want. I mean, liquidity has long been a concern for folks that are in the market to sell art. Correct. Yeah, I think that's right, and and I think a lot of those art funds, in fairness, have operated differently than we have. In that, you know, on the Masterworks platform now, we have over seven hundred thousand investors signed up who are, are are literally learning about art mostly for the first time. So we've we've had over now two hundred thousand onboarding calls that are thirty minute phone calls with investors talking about how art is an asset class performs, talking about specific artist markets, educating people on whatever, who Cecily Brown is, right? Like there's really nothing like that that's ever been done at scale. And then when those people invest, as you said, it's a whole new pool of capital that's coming into the art market. And I think that's really interesting to think about how that develops and how that evolves over the course of the the next decade. Well, you know, Scott, it it feels like we live in a really skeptical society these days where every new opportunity is accompanied by chatter about it being a scam. 
Why would somebody be skeptical of Masterworks product offering? Well, I, I don't, you know, I, I think there's there's lots of people in the art market that are certainly skeptical of the model. I think I think a lot of that has to do with um, the prior history of art funds, which is not, which is not frankly been that that great, right? Most art funds historically have failed. Um, we think we we know why for for various reasons, but um, without diving into that, I think that drives some of the skepticism. I, I think if you take a step back and just look at our business fundamentally. Um, we're heavily regulated. From an investment perspective, every single offering that we have is filed with the Securities and Exchange Commission, is qualified by the SEC. Uh, we're indirectly reg regulated through FINRA. We're becoming a registered investment advisor ourselves right now. Um, government agencies are, 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 are you know, very, very aware and very into the details of this business. And that's frankly the highest standard that any investor can expect is to invest in something that's a, that's a public offering. Um, so you don't, you know, you, you don't have to invest blindly. You don't have to trust us and what we're saying, but you have a, you have a regulated financial product where you can go to the SEC's website and you can read about it. So I think it's, I think it's the highest form of inve investor protection there is. Uh, for the investors that are used to the traditional, you know, publicly traded investment opportunities, art's going to look like an asset class that's kind of new and off the radar and something they wouldn't really have any knowledge of. Correct? Yeah, that's correct. And and I think that's true of of lots of lots of asset classes. I mean, we we spend a lot of time within our research team building tools to help investors understand how to think about the performance of art. So we're, we're the only research team today that really does robust index construction on the asset class. So, so investors can understand how is contemporary art specifically appreciating. Um, we publish those indices with firms like City. There's a lot of other wealth managers that, that rely on our data now for, um, for educating their clients. Um, but, but I think, you know, all, any investment product that's new, you need to present it to a way, um, in a way to investors so they can understand how to think about it as part of their portfolio. And if you take a step back and think about the definition of a strategic as asset class, just the, the fundamental definition of what should be included in an investment portfolio, it's something that, that outperforms inflation and lacks correlation to other asset classes. And I think anyone listening to this can, can very easily conclude when they see the prices of painting selling today in the art market, that those, those prices are outperforming inflation. Um, so our view is that the reason why people haven't historically allocated to art is not because it's not appreciating or that they don't know how it's appreciating. It's really because there hasn't been a way to allocate to it unless you have millions of dollars to buy a painting or tens of millions of dollars to build a portfolio. So it really hasn't been accessible to, to most people. So, you know, we were talking earlier about, you know, reasons for skepticism. Is the fee structure another point that people look at in terms of the fee structure that, that you have is more closely aligned to uh, something that you would see with uh, someone managing a hedge fund? And that doesn't necessarily look like an online stock market trading platform, right? Can you kind of talk about your fee structure and what people can expect to see there? Sure. I, yeah. I mean, look, high level, our fee structure is high compared to a lot of investing products. I think there's, I think there's no question about that. But if you look at our net returns in uh, 2021, sorry, 2020, they were above 20%. If you look at them in 2021, they're above 15%. Um, last year, they came down to uh, mid single digits. We're, we're still finalizing the numbers now. But collectively over that three-year period, the, the portfolio has performed better than any other asset class outside of energy. So we always try to focus investors on what are the net returns after fees rather than just focusing on fees themselves. Now, all of that being said, I think our fee structure is still incredibly reasonable. We, we have 215 employees. Um, we have a 14-person research team. We have a dozen people on our acquisitions team. We look at over $600 million in art offered to us every single month. We buy less than 5% of what we see. Um, there's, there's really nobody in, in the art market today that has the level of sophistication that we do when it comes to just investing in art. So I, I think it would be a mistake for an investor to simply choose um, you know, an alternative to Masterworks just because of fees 
based on the track record and the and the operation that we built. There's the one and a half percent management fee, and then there's the twenty percent of the profit at the at the end. And it looks like that that management fee isn't something that's paid annually in cash, but by issuing those additional Class A shares. And that, in turn, kind of dilutes the investor's share uh, the longer the piece is held, right? And so, I mean, I guess you've already addressed the fact that, you know, the fees are the fees. You know, you really should be looking at the bottom line, correct? Yeah, and, and I think even that 1.5%, I mean, look, at, at the end of the day, the reason we earn that 1.5% in equity is because paintings don't produce cash flow. There's, there's, no, there's no way to pay us, pay us a cash payment on an annualized basis from a painting. So we earn it in equity. But from an investor perspective, frankly, most investors like that because it aligns our interest with theirs and making sure the painting sells for, for a lot in the future. Um, so I think, it's, I think it's frankly good for investors. You know, I noticed that when you bring a painting to market, you set up an LLC that uh, you basically owns the title to to the painting, and that resides, you know, basically offshore in the Caymans. You know, regardless of where the painting actually physically resides. In my understanding, is that you know, at that point that it's transferred, there there winds up being something on the books called a true up payment that kind of covers a, a lot of your costs associated with getting the transaction kind of onboarded. Is that a cost that's kind of a pass through or is it always around 10%? I, I don't know if I've ever heard you really talk about that one. Yeah. So we, so we have a, a fee um, which covers our expenses called a, a true up. So 10% of every offering is, is this, this expense load that we, we build into the painting. So if we buy a million dollar painting, we wind up offering it on the platform for roughly $1.1 million. Um, that's, that's separate from our management fees. So, you know, the way that we think about that is that, um, again, our business is very expensive, right? It's, it's, uh, it's very expensive to go out, find these paintings at scale, look at hundreds of millions of dollars of art a month, um, buy works that that consistently appreciate and frankly outperform uh, our own contemporary art indices. Uh, we cover all regulatory costs. We cover all um, um, audit fees. We cover sales and use tax with that fee. You know, frankly, I think it's it's a fee that's much lower for investors than if they went into the art market and transacted themselves. Like if they were in the art market working with an auction house and auction house charges 20, 21% at the price points that we're buying at, uh, advisors charge 10%. Um, sales and use tax, frankly, depending on the state is whatever, seven or 8%. Um, so I think that that expense load is frankly low. Like we, we uh, have consistently had expenses that have exceeded that historically but we still charge investors just a, a, a 10% fee of the, of the overall offering. Well, you know, when it's time to sell the painting, there are typically a number of intermediaries that will charge a fee for facilitating that transaction like you were talking about. And, you know, I understand that if Masterworks is able to circumvent these intermediaries, it's able to charge the, the Cayman LLC a fee comparable to what would have been incurred from outside the company. And that tells me that your private sales department is potentially a really important cog in your continued profitability. You know, w would you agree with that? Uh, no. So we, we've actually taken that fee out of current offerings. So we, we did have that historically. We've never actually charged a fee for selling a painting. Um, so really the, the fees now for, for all of our offerings are the, the true up expense load when we purchase the painting for all of the reasons that I talked about. And then our management fees, which are really where, where we make profit over the long run, which is the 1.5% and 20% profit. There would still be the benefit there for the private sales in terms of avoiding the fee, but not necessarily uh, earning, the, earning that directly yourself, right? Yeah, and that's, that's a really important point. So in, in today's world, with, with the scale where the business is now, more than 50% of the paintings we buy are direct from collectors, and more than 50% of the paintings we sell are direct to collectors. So those are entirely transaction, transaction free, um, which, which benefits investors. And I think that's our view long-term is that as that, as, as kind of the largest buyer in the art market, we, we can't pay full fees like collectors typically would. 
So we expect intermediaries that we're working with, if we're doing a lot of business to, to significantly reduce those fees, um, or we're doing business with collectors directly where, where there are no fees. I mean, it sounds like your bread and butter is that unaccredited investor class, but do you ever look at diversifying and, and looking at bringing in institutional money, give opportunities for hedging? Or, or do those institutional investors have the capacity to be operating in the art world on their own, given the, the amount of money they have on hand? Yeah. So we, you know, again, our our world is complicated from a regulatory perspective. So without diving into the details, I don't think it's it's probable that we'll see even in the next decade um, any institutional manager buy whole art, um, buy actual paintings for for a whole whole host of reasons. We we do have a partnership with a large asset manager, which we haven't announced yet. Um, who's who's kind of a, a well-known name that will be buying our, our securities into a, a public fund structure. So investors who um, are interested in investing through them can can do it via a public fund. They have they have their own strategy. They have their own fees, um, separate and independent of us. But um, but I, I, I do think we'll see more products like that come come out in the future. You know, we were talking earlier about liquidity and just the ability for works to move, to be offered up, to be purchased, to be sold. You know, there's also the question of liquidity for your investors, right? You know, I guess that's a concern that some people have is that, you know, if I were to buy a number of shares, in particular painting at $20 a share, I'm in that until that painting moves. But I know that you you guys have a trading platform within Masterworks. Is liquidity for your customers a concern? And are the people that are on the platform terribly concerned about it? Or are they comfortable with locking into a longer term investment? Um, yeah, so our, our, all of our investors go through something called suitability when we when we onboard them. So when you have a phone call with the financial advisor at Masterworks, they walk you through how you're investing today, what your experience level is, um, and they confirm as part of that suitability process that you're capable of holding that investment for up to 10 years. And that's that's the guidance that we give all investors. It, you know, as, as an aside, like I've, I've seen lots of art funds that guide people to three-year, five-year holds, and we just don't believe that that's, that's possible for this asset class. Like we think people really need to be focused on a 10-year horizon, uh, which effectively makes this this investment an illiquid security. Separate from that, we we have launched secondary markets, so we do now have people trading shares in in all of these paintings. I think the you know the liquidity on the secondary market is limited. I, I always tell people if you expect to sell your shares on our secondary market and you have a a reasonable asking price, I would expect that transaction to clear in weeks. Um, definitely not days, definitely not seconds. So it's it's not like a publicly traded security um, where you can get out of it at any any moment in time. But it's still much better than having having to wait ten years. Um, but yeah, I mean that's that's how we position to investors. They should be prepared to wait, but the secondary market can be a benefit if they if they can. Let's talk a little bit more about the art. And so it sounds like you have a research and acquisitions team that's really invested a lot of resources in being able to figure out what artworks are good prospects for being offered up as as assets. What what names are we looking at here? Well, we don't we don't disclose our, our artist list um, publicly, so that 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 we sort of view that as um, as confidential. But it's. It's brand name artists, right? We're a, we're a large buyer of Basquiat. We're a large buyer, frankly, of artists like Banksy. We buy artists like Cecily Brown. We buy artists like Gunter Ford. We buy artists like Stanley Whitney. So we we buy um, we buy both sort of what I would describe as blue chip, ten million dollar plus paintings. Um, we buy living artists who are five hundred thousand dollars or a million dollars. Um, it's really very dependent on the artist's market and and kind of the activity we're we're seeing in that market. Again, I, I know you guys probably have uh, a lot of resources towards kind of picking apart what would gain the the most value over the over the long term. But do you see a bigger upside 
right now in the purchase of artists that would be categorized as underrepresented? I mean, when we start talking about the art world and we start talking about museums, uh, you know, we we see that you know traditionally museums are are full of the artwork of of white males. There is a push for that to change, and do we see that as being something that you know those underrepresented minorities or under, underrepresented classes being a place where there could be growth in the value of of those artists? I think absolutely that's that's true, and we we've seen that in the data for quite some time now. Um, you know, we've, we've been big buyers of Sam Gilliam. We've been big buyers of Joan Mitchell, um, obviously very different, but I, but I think fall under the same, the same, the same theme. Um, and we, we frankly see that trend continuing. I think a lot of people continue to be skeptical of it uh, and question and, and question whether it, it will continue, but we see it continuing. You know, it seems like your target investor probably isn't bringing a, a lot of art knowledge to the table. Do you think that their investment in these works is sparking enough curiosity that it's actually opening them up to uh, a world of art appreciation? I mean, do is there any way to track whether or not we're actually converting these investors into novice art lovers? Yeah, it's a really it's a really interesting question. I I personally believe that that the journey has to start somewhere. And I think if the journey starts with an investment in an object, uh, most people inherently become much more engaged uh, over time. It's 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 a it's a question that we've been we've been actually wanting to test with an institution around um, working with an institution to to allow their members to invest in a particular painting, and then tracking how often those those members would come back uh, to that museum over time and see if the the frequency of of visits actually increased um because of that my, my gut tells me it 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 will um you know but again i think we're still pretty pretty early on in the process a lot of times these big ticket art pieces wind up getting acquired in sitting uh, in a free port uh, kind of locked away from, from where anybody could ever see them but i you know i saw in the wording uh, of your documents that the llc and the caymans has the right to display land or lease the work where deemed appropriate and i know that exhibition history is a key component in an artwork's value so can you talk about the benefits of working alongside museums and galleries to kind of get the work out there over the course of it being in your protection? Yeah, so I don't I don't know if we necessarily agree that exhibition generally increases the value of of paintings. We've done a lot of research on this and I, I would say just very simply we believe that that relevant exhibitions uh, can have an impact on on value. That, that being said, if, if we take a step back and we just go to sort of the beginning of this conversation on what problem we're trying to solve, I think the problem is, is a two-step problem. The first step is how do we democratize ownership in, in all of these great objects and really increase the amount of money coming into the art market and allow the art market to expand? I think that the second step to that is once we have all of these, these great artworks, which we have today, how do we create a framework, frankly, in the, the form of an institution or a museum where those paintings can be displayed for general public good? And that's, that's the second step that we're, that we're working on now. Um, not surprisingly, with a, with a lot of what we do, there's a lot of complexity in that. But that is, that is something that, that I'd like to solve over the next year or two to where all of these paintings wind up um, in the public rather, rather than in storage. So do you guys currently have a gallery space? We, we have a gallery within our office uh, downtown that, that we use with, with intermediaries. Um, we, we don't have a gallery outside of that. We're, um, we're working on potentially creating uh, a gallery space on the Upper East Side to make it easier to interact with intermediaries uh, and collectors. Uh, but, but right now that, that doesn't exist. So what's on the horizon? I imagine it's more of the same, but... Have you have you guys thought about sculptures? I, I know I'm probably not the first person who's asking you that, but you know someone like Anish Kapoor, or you know I know that you guys have sold a number of calls, 2D paintings. Uh, it seems like calls may be an interesting place to start if you were thinking about getting into 3D. 
Yeah, sculpture, sculpture is a little bit complicated. So large sculpture is very, very hard to resale. So we, we, um, we're always, we're always making sure that, you know, there's, there's ultimately an exit for investors. I think outside of that, it's very artist market dependent. So for example, we, we've always, um, thought about buying Calder as a market. We haven't officially added Calder to our buy list yet. Um, so I think I think that's more what's driving the fact that that we haven't acquired sculpture yet than than sculpture itself. What about the the lower end of the market? I mean, it feels like your guys' floor is in the million dollar range, and it seems like that number's only gone up over the last three or four years for you guys. But do you see a future where you guys dip down into the the more mid career artists that are transacting in the the fifty to hundred thousand dollar range? And what would that look like? Because I imagine that that would have to be something where would probably have to bundle the those pieces together and when you start bundling does does it not look like masterworks anymore yeah it's it's a good question so so you're you're exactly right i mean our our challenge with smaller paintings is actually nothing it, it has nothing to do with to, that we don't want to buy smaller paintings it's just that the highly regulated world we live in is very expensive and there's there's no way to make it work um with the fees that we're paying for each individual painting. I mean, frankly, I think we could we could argue that even at a million dollars, there's not there's not a great business case for us from from the amount of money that we spend to um, to kind of get that that painting public. Um, you you're correct. The the way that we thought about it in the future, if we do do it, is either creating an investment fund um, where we buy paintings into that fund and allow investors to immediately invest. Or frankly, just buying those paintings onto our balance sheet, waiting a number of years um, until there's there's more data around that artist market, and then potentially offering the painting almost almost a venture fund concept within Masterworks. Um, that's that's how we're thinking about it today. But but in general, it's very hard, right? We spend the same amount of time on a fifty thousand dollar painting that we do on a ten million dollar painting. It's it's hard to scale. Um, it's hard with our cost structure. It appears that Masterworks is profitable, and it's uh, obvious that your customers are seeing a positive return. And that being the case, the um, massive amount of venture financing that you obtained a couple of years back, how does that help you? How are you able to utilize those funds in addition to your profitability? Does that go into a lot of the infrastructure? Does that get sucked up by all the regulatory things that you have to face? Yeah, for, I mean, for us, it's 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 kind of a combination of of all of the above, right? It's marketing expense, it's um, any any paintings that that we're we're purchasing before we're selling them off um, on the platform. There's there's negative cash flow um, from that perspective. Uh, you know, it's general operating expenses. So we 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 did raise 110 million dollars in October of uh, 2021, um, but we have the majority of that that's still on our balance sheets. So I think, you know, I think you're right. I mean, we, we feel good about the profitability of the business and the balance sheet generally. The venture funds that invested in you, what do they see as the exit strategy for, for Masterworks? Uh, you know, we, we've talked probably three or four times in this conversation about liquidity. How do they see exiting their, their relationship with Masterworks down the line? Is Masterworks the type of company that would become a, a public offering? What does that look like? Yeah, I mean the the good the good the good news about us is we we are the largest filer of public offerings with the SEC, so we're we're very familiar <laughs> with uh, with with the going public process. Um, I, I think that's I think that's the most likely scenario for the company is to to take it public at some point. Um, I don't think we're we're there there today, but I think two three years from now that that probably makes the most sense. Tell me about you personally, Scott. I understand that you've been collecting art for a long time. It, it sounds like you have a background in ventures and online advertising. It seems like your DNA is all over the company. What what sort of art do you collect personally? So I, yeah, I mean, I, I've been collecting art uh, for almost 20 years. I think like many collectors, I've, I've went through different journeys of, um, you know, to, trying to uh, to figure out exactly what, what I like collecting. And what I find interesting <clears throat> for me that that ultimately wound up being Abex. Um, so I, you know, I collect people like Clifford Still and 
Klein, um, Rothko, um, you know, kind of well, well-known mid-century artists. And it's funny, I get, I get asked that question a lot. Like, what, what are you, what are you collecting and how does that compare to, to masterworks? And I would say Avex generally is, is not the most interesting investment in, in today's art world, but it, it's always what I've loved having on my walls. So that's kind of, that's kind of, uh, that's kind of what it is, I guess. Yeah. I mean, it seems like the perfect candidates for being in the masterworks portfolio are those artists that are, I would say late career. They're, they're still alive. They've, uh, they have an established market presence that doesn't appear there's going to be anything they can do to their career. That's going to cause it to go in the wrong direction. You know, it's funny, you know, I, I've heard you talk about, you know, kind of the, the life cycle uh, of the value of art and how Dutch master paintings, you know, at this point, you're lucky to keep up with inflation versus if you are going to see appreciation, it's going to be with living artists at this point, right? Well, I, it's not necessarily true. So the, the, the it's, it's probably worth talking through kind of some of our, our very first learnings on art market data, high level. Um, and it's really amazing. I mean, even after collecting for 20 years until starting Masterworks, I didn't appreciate this dynamic. Um, but if you look at returns in the art market very broadly, returns are, are correlated with recency in very wide increments. And, and what that means is that if you look at art created in the past 75 years, post-war contemporary, that segment of the art market appreciates today over the past, the past 20, 25 years at 13 to 14% a year. <clears throat> if you roll back to modern art, that segment appreciates at 9 to 10% a year. If you roll back to impressionist art, that segment now is at about 6% a year, maybe 5 to 6% a year. And then if you roll back even further to old masters, old masters appreciate at, at roughly 1% to 2% a year. Um, as an aside, it's, it's sort of interesting. Generally, when you see appreciation rates go down, you also see volatility or risk go down until you get to old masters, which then exhibit very high uh, volatility or risk as well as very low returns. But I think what that, what, that, what that tells us from an investing perspective is that we should always expect returns to decrease for a particular artist market as that, that market ages in time. It doesn't happen in on, on a yearly basis. It somewhat happens on a decade basis or, or frankly, probably more importantly, a generational basis. And I think that, that learning alone helps inform how to think about the appreciation of your collection um, in the coming years. So is that related to recency bias or is it related to what, what, what can we attribute that to? Our, our view, which is a very, a very simple view, is that it's, it's frankly related to fashion, that the types of art that we want to buy today is, is not the same type of art that our grand, grand, grandparents wanted to buy. And that as generations change, tastes change, um, and therefore we see older art depreciate or have less demand over time. You know, I, I guess another thing I think about is, uh, you know, we were talking about the underrepresented artist groups. You know, I think there have been a number of books in the last couple of years looking back and rediscovering female artists from past generations. And it seems like, you know, somebody like Artemisia Gintileski is an artist who maybe didn't uh, carry a lot of appreciation in the value of her paintings up until the point that we've, you know, we've kind of rewritten the canon and uh, reevaluated the role of some of these artists like her in their time period, right? And so, there are probably still artists back there whose value you know, is still on the uptick. You know, it's it's a really really interesting thing to to pick apart, right? Yeah, I think I think that's right, and I think that is the role that a lot of museum directors are playing today is is trying to figure out how to to revisit history. Um, you know, the market though is often very slow to catch on with that, right? It takes it takes years, I think, for the market to to sort of catch on to that and really really appreciate it. But we we've seen that happen over the past. I don't even know how long it's been now, seven, eight plus years. I think we'll continue to see it um, going into the future, mainly because institutions are are dedicated to to revisiting that history. Well, you know, these types of conversations straddle that line between 
art for art's sake, art for the love of art, art for and, you know communicating and connecting, and then you know, talking about art uh, as an asset class, kind of devoid of emotion, looking just at the numbers, right? And the the art world has a, a funny relationship with money, right? I'm I'm sure you you kind of deal with that every day, right? Yeah, I mean, look, at, at the end of the day, we, we hear a, a lot of these comments that Masterworks is making art about money. And I, I laugh at those comments, right? Because I don't think there's any way that anyone with a straight face can walk into a gallery, stand in front of a painting that's offered for millions of dollars and say that it's not about money. Like it's about money to everyone in that value chain at that point in time. I think we're more honest about it. And I think we're, we're more transparent about it. Um, but I think the art world is, is a lot about money for, for better, or for worse. Um, and I think from, from our perspective, we, we don't think that's necessarily bad, right? Like I think that just making it more inclusionary is important where people can invest in these paintings outside of, of people who are, who are just millionaires. Um, so we're, we're fine with being, being transparent about it, but I, I don't think there's any honesty in saying that, that the art world today is, is not about money. Do you have anything on the horizon that you're excited about that you can speak freely about? Well, it's really, I mean, our, our business is, um, is fairly predictable in today's world, right? Like we, we have a lot of um, product changes that we're always working on. We're working this year on building out more liquidity in our secondary market. I, I mentioned um, this, this kind of institutional partnership that we have. Uh, we recently have, have been making changes to our mobile app to make it easier for investors to, to review different paintings to invest in. Um, we're expanding our artist list this year by another 20 or 30 artists. So we'll be buying in 160 artist markets. Um, but, but really the, the game now is, is, is a lot about execution, right? It will we'll soon have this year, we'll cross more than a million investors on the platform. Um, we'll be launching probably more than one painting a day. We're launching a painting now about every, every day and a half. Holy cow. So it, it, it's, it's, yeah, it's more, it's, it's more of an operational scale game at this point. You know, that leads me to another question, which is, um, how has your job changed? Because it's, it's a lot different starting it up and getting it rolling when it's, uh, one painting every 90 days versus four or five paintings a week. Does your job look drastically different than it did three years ago? Are there more headaches? Are they different headaches? Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's always evolving. So I, I mean, I, I've, uh, we were talking about my background. So I've been starting technology companies since, since I was a kid across casual gaming, online advertising, uh, fintech, and then masterworks. So this is the, the third company that I've, that I've gone through with this. And it, you know, it's different. I mean, I think, I think we all like different stages of, of operating. I mean, in some ways, I like very early stage companies when it's five people in a room trying to figure, figure things out. In other ways, I like, I like later stage companies, but, um, you know, Masterworks is still in growth mode. I mean, we have, we have 215 employees. I think by the end of this year, we'll be around 300 people. So it's still not huge, um, but it's definitely, it's definitely different than it, than it was early on. Well, Scott, I know you're a busy person and you've got a lot on your plate. And I, I really appreciate you taking time out of your day to um, open up and uh, answer every single one of my uh, annoying questions. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, man, I, I really appreciate you uh, making yourself available. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah. That's all the time we have for this week. You've been listening to ArtSense. You can find the show on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. If you've enjoyed this podcast, be sure to subscribe. And while you're there, please rate the show and leave a quick review. Your feedback is the key to other folks finding us. And if you'd like to see images related to the conversation, read the transcript, and find other bonus features, you can go to cambia.art and click on the podcast tab. If you'd like to reach out to me, you can email me at craig at cambia.art. Thanks for listening. Thank you.